Hi everyone, I am Kia Zupa. I work as a security consultant at Lexvo and today I'm going to present you how to hack a capsule hotel. Everything you're going to see in that presentation happened when I was traveling in a foreign country for holidays. I booked a few nights in what we call a capsule hotel and I noticed that they were using several different technologies, which was pretty cool. For those who don't know what a capsule hotel is, it's a hotel with really small rooms that are stacked side by side. You just have a bed and nothing else. There is no more space. The bathroom and the living room are part of the common area and you usually close your room with a curtain. People in that country are really respectful. It's a big part of their culture and this kind of hotel helps them in different ways. For example, if a man is too drunk to return home safely, if he is embarrassed to face his wife, then he can sleep in a place like this. And in general, it's pretty cheap compared to our hotels. So see this, what, this is what the hotel looked like. Uh, in this photo, you have three bedrooms. In your room, you have an adjustable bed, a light, a ventilation fan, and that's it. You put your suitcase under the bed and you can close your room by pulling down the curtain and locking it with a key. This capsule hotel was using the following technologies. The entrance of each floor is protected by an NFT badge. In some rooms, you can mirror your device on the curtain with a video projector. You need a special adapter and an iPhone for that. And finally, you can control your own bedroom with an iPod Touch given at check-in. On the photo, you can see the iPod Touch, the NFC badge, and the key used to lock the curtain. The iPod Touch comes with an application that allows to control your bedroom. You can change the position of the adjustable bed and transform it to a sofa. You can control the power of the light and you can also turn on or off the ventilation fan. Now, what about the security of all of this? Well, the iPod Touch is connected ever using Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. So there must be a way to communicate with whatever is controlling the bedroom. And when I saw all of these features, I thought it was pretty cool because it means that if I hack them, I could potentially control all the hotel bedrooms. <laughs> and this would be awesome, right? But I'm traveling, I don't have a lot of equipment with me and I just have a few weeks left to enjoy this country. I don't know if I would succeed if I tried to hack them or if I would just fail and waste my time trying to do that. So I like the idea, but I'm still hesitating. And then I met my friend Bob. <laughs> Let me present you, Bob. A neighbor woke me up two times during my stay. He woke me up because he was making phone calls at 2 a.m. in the morning and he was speaking really loudly. So the second night I went to see him and I asked him politely to speak more quietly. And he told me, yeah, sure, no problem, man. Then I came back to my bedroom and he started to speak just like before. There was no change, yeah. Some people just don't care, man. <laughs> and I take my sleep seriously, especially on holidays. So I thought it would be nice if I could take control of his room and make him have a lovely night. <laughs> and this is how everything started. The first thing I did was to explore my bedroom and search for the objects uh, that were being used. This is the first object I found in my room. When I first looked at it, I had no idea of what it was. It turns out that it's just light, really. <laughs> this is a Pioma UGL2 wall-mounted light, and this is used in case of emergency. Uh, if there is an earthquake of magnitude 4 or greater, a red light will indicate it. It's just here for safety reasons. This is not interesting for us. We don't really care about that. The next object was I found was a Nasnos remote. Nasnos is a company specialized in home automation. 
This remote allows to control up to five nice-nose devices. It can be used in case the iPod Touch is lost or if the application doesn't work, for example. It uses radio waves with a specific frequency and you can use it uh, up to 15 meters. By searching on the internet, you can see this remote is customizable. Uh, you can put your own stickers on it depending on what type of device you will interact with. Uh, this remote can be used to control products from Nasnos such as electric curtains, light dimmers, ventilation fans and other devices. A Delta Drive DS2 motor is present. It is an electric motor used to make the bed adjustable. On the top of the photo you can see a remote connected with a cable that can be used to control it. It was difficult to see what was under the bed and I could not go fully under it, so I didn't see what this motor was connected to. But because we previously saw that uh, the remote can be used to control it, we can guess the wireless connectivity is made possible with another NASNOS device. A Nasnos CS8700 router is present in each room. It allows to control Nasnos devices from a Wi-Fi environment. It does that simply by converting actions it receives through the Wi-Fi to radio waves on the frequency used by the remote with privacy. So, this means you can control any Nasnos device from an Android smartphone or an iOS device, for example. I could not see that device because it was hidden between the walls, but I knew it was here because I identified it after performing a Wi-Fi scan. I found several e-societies starting with the name uh, Nasnos CS8700. And by the way, the photo you see was taken from the internet, yeah. <laughs> I didn't tear down the wall, I'm not that savage. This router can be used with two types of architecture. The first architecture is using only the Wi-Fi router. You connect to the NASNOS router using your smartphone and then you can interact with other NASNOS devices, electric curtains, lights, etc. It is this type of architecture that was being used by the hotel. The second possible architecture allows you to control NASNOS devices directly from the internet. It is basically the same setup, but you will have to configure your ISP router so that it allows you to communicate with the NASNOS access point from the internet. Yeah, I mean, what could go wrong with an architecture like this? I wonder what. <laughs> okay, so now we know the different devices present in our bedroom and we are going to start the exploitation phase. So, this is what the application installed on the iPod Touch looks like. The application allows you to change the position of the adjustable bed. You can control the power of the room lights and you can also turn on or off the ventilation fan. When I first tried to exit the application, I saw that it wasn't possible. I could not exit the application or turn off the iPod Touch. But, when I triple tapped on the home button, I noticed that a passcode was asked. By searching on the internet, I found that this behavior was due to an iOS feature uh, called gated access. As you can see in the iOS documentation, it says that gated access limits your device to a single app and lets you control which features are available. To end a gated access session, triple click the home button until you get access passcode, then tap end. This feature is used when you want to let a child use the device, for example, so that it can only use the application you want and not the other ones. After reading the documentation, I knew that protection was being used because of the device behavior. The, first, the thing is that this protection is only configured at runtime. This means the protection is no longer present if we reboot the device. Yes, we cannot turn off the iPod, top, the iPod by pressing the button, but we can still drain its battery, then connect it to the power and reboot the device. 
Once you do that, the protection is no more here and we can access everything we want over applications and the iPod Touch settings. Once I bypassed that protection, I started to look at the device settings. Uh, the device is enrolled in a mobile device management solution and two Wi-Fi networks are saved on it. There is an enterprise network using WPA2 and a network named NASNOS CS8700 that is using web. During the information gathering part, we previously saw that the NASNOS router allows to control over NASNOS devices from an, a Wi-Fi environment. And our goal is to take control of all bedrooms. So we are going to target this network. There are different solutions we can use to obtain the key of the NASNOS network. We could jailbreak the iPod Touch. Once we are root on the device, we can access the keychain and obtain the key of the saved Wi-Fi network. But this solution is quite aggressive and we don't want to alter the phone too much because it's not a property. The next solution is to use what is called iCloud keychain. If we unlock this feature, this would synchronize the keychain over all iPod devices that share the same iCloud account. Using a Mac, uh, we can then see the saved Wi-Fi keys by opening the keychain. But we don't have a Mac with us. Another solution would be to attack the WS feature if it's present on the router. Uh, a vulnerability was found in WPS in 2011, which allows to retrieve the Wi-Fi key with a brute force attack. Unfortunately, the NASNOS router doesn't support this feature. The last solution is to target the web protocol. The web protocol is well known for being insecure since 2001. You can now retrieve a web key by capturing around 80,000 packets using aircrack. It's crazy that web is still used in 2021. This seems the best solution for us, so this is what we're going to do. After performing a Wi-Fi scan, a total of 119 NASNOS access points were detected. The SSID name is based on the two light bytes of the BSSID, and the authentication mode is open. Here you can see a screenshot of all the detected NASNOS access points. Each access point corresponds to a bedroom. This means we could potentially access and control 119 bedrooms. It just depends on the power of the Wi-Fi adapter we have. Okay, so I want to grab the web key, but we are traveling and I don't have a lot of equipment with me. I only have two Wi-Fi cards that do not support injection properly. But do we really need to inject packets if we control the iPod Touch? We can still use the monitor mode to capture packets. Uh, we just have to find a way to make the iPod device generate a lot of data. To do so, I came up with a simple JavaScript code. It just loads images on the same network so that it forces the device to generate IP requests. We save that code to the iPod Touch by connecting it to an access point we create. We then connect it back to the NASNOS access point and we execute it. After a while, we were able to retrieve the Wi-Fi key. It was CS8700 something. We connected to the NASNOS access point using that key and we noticed a few things. First, the router web interface is accessible with default credentials. The password starts with 123 and I will let you guess what comes after. It is also powered by a URT module from a company based in Beijing in China. Okay, so now we are connected to the Wi-Fi and we want to know the iPod Touch, what the iPod Touch application does. Uh, to do so, we are going to set up a man in the middle architecture in order to inspect the traffic. For the equipment, we only have an Android smartphone and a laptop with two wireless cards. So here is the man in the middle architecture I set up. I created an access point with my Android smartphone and then I connected 
to the iPod Touch and my laptop to it. On the iPod, I configured it so that it uses my laptop as the gateway and I could observe traffic. I enabled EPF routing on my laptop so that it acts as a router and I connected my second laptop Wi-Fi card to the NASNOS access point. So every packet the iPod sends will pass through my laptop and then arrive to the NASNOS router. Once the man in the middle architecture was set up, I just pressed on every button of the Apple Touch application and, and I observed the traffic. I saw that packets were sent to the NASNOS router on TCP port 8000. In the table, you can see the content of the TCP packets sent for each action. When you use a feature with a long press, the packets are sent continuously until you release the button. As you can see, there is no authentication and no encryption. That is good for us. After that, I just developed a program that sends the same packets depending on the action. Uh, this means we are now able to control a bedroom from a laptop. <laughs> so here's a script I made. All actions available on the iPod applications are implemented. Uh, you can turn on or off the light, same with the fan, and you can play with the bed position. On the second command, you can see the packets being sent when we transform the bed into a sofa. The packets are sent continuously in that case. Okay, it's cool. Uh, we can now take control of our own bedroom, but can we control all bedrooms? This is why we're doing all of this. The first thing, the thing is that we don't know if the Wi-Fi key is uh, generated or set manually. When we look at the value of the retrieved key, there might be a chance that it was generated automatically because there is the name of the CS8007 um, router in it. I looked for more information about the NASNOS router and I found an application from NASNOS available on Google Play Store. Uh, you have several features in that application, but there is only one that interests us. Uh, from this app, you can set up the Wi-Fi configuration of the NASNOS router. So I decided to reverse engineer the application in order to see if there was an algorithm that was being used to generate the Wi-Fi key. Unfortunately, the analysis of the application does not show that the key is generated. And when you look into the documentation of the NASNOS router, it's the same. Uh, there is nothing mentioning where to find the Wi-Fi key. It doesn't seem to be wrote on a sticker behind the router or anything. So there is no information that tends to say that the router is pre-configured and that the key is automatically generated. However, I found another vulnerability. Packets are sent to the NASNOS router on UDP port 988. This is a remote configuration service from the sample Wi-Fi URLT that waits for AT instructions. The reality is that you can access the Wi-Fi configuration of the router with authentication and you can also reconfigure it. Here is a screenshot of the exploit. The Wi-Fi configuration is dumped without authentication. Uh, you can see we retrieve the network configuration at the top, the SSID, and at the bottom right, uh, we get the Wi-Fi key. I'm on holidays and I'm here to travel. So I decided to leave the hotel and visit another city for a few days. I then came back to the same hotel and got assigned another bedroom. I used the same technique as before with the JavaScript payload to generate data and to crack the Wi-Fi key. Once I got it, I noticed a similarity with the Wi-Fi key of my old bedroom. As you can see, only the four last X characters seem to change. If this is the case, this would mean there are only 65,536 possibilities, which is nothing. After opening a new IV, we can launch an offline dictionary attack with a file containing all the possible keys. In order to crack a web key, you need at least four IVs. So to capture IVs from our bedrooms, the best thing to do is to let a laptop run all night with monitor mode. Then uh, let you sleep 
wake up and see if we, not, if we have another surprise. And we have a good surprise. <laughs> we were right. Only the four last X characters of the keys change. You can see that we found the Wi-Fi key of each SSID on the right of the table. As long as we have at least four IV, we cannot control all bedrooms we want. So let's just do it. Time for the demo. You can see we have three bedrooms in front of us. At the top right, there is my laptop screen. And first, I'm going to take control of the bedrooms on the right. So I connect to it. I dump it, Wi-Fi configuration. And now check what's going to happen. Okay, we play with the light. Now let's take control of the bedroom in the middle. Check what's going to happen. <laughs> this is my favorite part. We transform the bed into a, the sofa into a bed and now we put the back the bed to sofa. And finally, we are going to take control of the bedroom on the left. <laughs> we play with the light and we're not gonna turn on the fan it's difficult to notice but if you listen closely you can hear it What I didn't tell you is that when I came back to the hotel, Bob was still here. And uh, now that we can control every bedroom, let's not forget about him. In order to take control of his room, we first have to identify the SSID and link it to it. People who are staying in that hotel are travelers. So they are not here during daytime. They are outside visiting. So what I did is that I listed the SSID with the most power around this room. I then used my laptop to turn on the light of each SSID. And when I noticed a change in his room, I knew that it was the access point I was looking for. I then tried to imagine the best scenario I could for him. And a good one for a memorable night is to create a script that every three hours will transform the bed into a sofa, and put it back in place, turn on and off the light. 
I lost that script at midnight and I'm sure he had a wonderful night. <laughs> Conclusion, we were able to take control of all the bedrooms we want. A total of six vulnerabilities were found. First, gated access mode was bypassed on the iPod. Uh, the Wi-Fi key was even cracked quite easily because the web protocol was being used. Uh, the sample Wi-Fi URT web interface used default credentials. A national service allowed us to send actions without authentication. An availability allows to read and write the Wi-Fi configuration. And finally, we noticed that non-random keys were being used. Of course, all sensitive elements were modified for this presentation. And after all of that, I contacted both Nasnos and the hotel. The hotel was really cool and took these issues seriously. Uh, we are not using a new architecture, so it is not possible to exploit vulnerabilities in that hotel anymore. I was so curious about the Wi-Fi keys we found, because at the end, we don't know if the key is generated by Nasnos or set up by the hotel. So I simply asked the hotel about it, and they told me that the SSID and the key are generated by Nasnos by default. So if this is true, this means that by default, all NASNOS CS8700 routers are using non-random keys and are vulnerable. We tried to contact NASNOS to report all the remedies we found, but unfortunately, we never had any answer. And concerning Bob, I hope he will be more respectful to neighbors in the future and that he is not too scared about ghosts now. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this talk and thanks for your attention.